this morning and share with you all. Uh, let me just make sure my screen is being shared with you, uh, just in case you don't have a copy of the lesson. Uh, there we go. We're going to have a word of prayer. Um, I'll just share very briefly that I'm also very thankful to uh, be able to be here to fellowship with you all with health, um, or healthier, I should say, than I was, a bit healthier. Um, definitely still have cancer, but um, I'm not as in a sickly condition as I was. Um, I can definitely say that, and I'm very grateful to it. Um, but also I consider um, the, the serious times that we're living in and how there are a lot of sick people. Uh, there's one specific sickness uh, that has been the focal point, uh, but there are a lot more sicknesses that exist. There are a lot more people suffering from other things. So it is something to consider um, that we need to continue to encourage people to live a certain way and to eat healthy and to do all those things that are, are needed uh, to maintain health as best as possible. Um, and I also want to just mention, I'm very thankful for the testimonies that were shared uh, by you all. Uh, we're not always aware of how much testimonies help other people. So uh, be faithful in sharing your testimony. Uh, you may think that you don't have an influence or you may think that your words are small, but uh, anything that is uh, a witness of God or a witness of Christ and God's mighty work is a blessing to souls. So uh, take advantage of the opportunity you have to share what God has done. Many are unaware of God's working. Uh, many of the testimonies you share are actually things that other people went through that they did not identify as God actually working among them. So uh, please be faithful to, to share those things, to encourage people to also share what they have gone through so that everyone can be strengthened. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to have a word of prayer. Uh, let me just connect, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know if I will be able to connect it. Let's, work, let's have a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for your patience, for your regard, for your faithfulness. We thank you that you have not rewarded us according to our iniquities and that you have allowed us this opportunity uh, yet again to worship together, uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Uh, may our hearts be committed to you at this time as we uh, consider your promise that even now you are seeking for true worshipers. Uh, we pray that there will be none among us who do not truly desire to hear your word and to follow it, uh, cursing themselves. Lord, may we be open. Uh, may we be willing. May there be a heart that is uh, submitted to thee to do all that you say. Let us not be controlled, Father, by our own human reasoning, by our own life experience, by those things that are fighting for the supremacy to supremacy, pardon me, but may we have freedom to serve you. Uh, may there be no, uh, no chains of sin or, uh, upon us uh, that would hinder us from being able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you for this opportunity to come together to study your word. May your people be strengthened. May they be encouraged. May they be converted. Bless us with thy spirit, and may Christ be exalted is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, we are going to finish our Bible study on Joshua chapter 7. Uh, Lord willing, we want to get through these questions and verses to gain uh, an understanding of why God has even put these things there uh, in his word. Let's first turn to Romans. Uh, Romans 15. Romans 15, if you remember in our study together, uh, we had been uh, looking at the experience of Joshua and why they fell to a tragedy uh, where many died. Um, and it's easy um, to teach from that perspective. Uh, death has a certain influence on the human mind. Um, if we are mindful, 
then we will be able to recognize uh, a serious moment. And what I mean by that is that if we consider what the Bible is talking about, uh, when we read the Bible and we read that someone died, it should have an effect upon our minds and it should cause us to inquire, you know, what was the uh, uh, experience of the people of that time? Um, and what would, what would have been our experience? You know, uh, we've been, uh, I'm sure, familiar with uh, life experiences where we've heard of people dying, but what if it is your relative? What if it is your friend? What if it is your family? What if it is even you? Uh, what is the influence of that experience? And this is something that we must consider in reading a story like we find in Joshua chapter 7, where people are believers just like you and I, they worship just like you and I, they desire to be saved, they desire to be in harmony with God, they are believing that God is with them, and then they learn that God is not with them by a terrible tragedy. And this experience is not just subject to Joshua 7. Uh, uh, the Bible does tell that this will be the experience of many believers in the end time where they will be surprised to know that God is far from them. And in their surprise, they will lose their life. They will lose their salvation. So this is something that's very important, brothers and sisters. This is something that you, you want it to settle in your mind. It should trouble us, as it were, um, as we think of it. Not to say God is mean or wrong, but to say, uh, am I overlooking a an important aspect of my relationship with God, where it has led me to believe something that is not true, um, which intent and in, in, in which ultimately will lead me to be separated from God while thinking I'm uh, bound or closely tied to God. Um, I want to read a verse here in Romans uh, 15. Uh, Romans 15, and I want to read starting in verse 4. Romans 15 and verse 4, just a verse to give us a kind, to kind of give us a perspective uh, or foundation for our study and put us in the right uh, mind state. The Bible says in Romans 15 and verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Uh, the important thing about this verse is it shows that our hope in God, our hope in the future, any positive hope we may have is based on something. Uh, you may hear someone say, I hope so. Consider what, what does that mean when someone says, I hope so? Um, a lot of times when people say, I hope so, there is no certainty uh, involved. There is no true uh, expectation involved, meaning they're hoping for something that even they may be challenged with, or even they may not believe that it's possible. Uh, God doesn't uh, present that type of hope as a, as a reasonable hope. You want your hope to be a hope that is based on something. You want your hope to be a hope that is based on something that will be realized. You don't want a hope that is based on uncertainty. So here the Bible says that our hope is tied to what we learn, specifically from the Bible that was written in the past, as well as through that, it can teach us something. So past experiences in the Bible have a certain influence. Um, if we will learn those things, those influences uh, can bring us to an experience where we can gain patience, we can learn the art of waiting, as it were, waiting on God, meaning uh, the experience where our faith is being tried and we do not, or our, where our faith is being tried without it being shaken, okay, patience. And the Bible talks about this idea of being comforted. We're not just talking about a physical type of comfort that you need when you go through a tragedy or a hard experience, but this comfort comes as one repents. The Bible talks about a specific comfort that comes from the comforter, which is the comfort that we are definitely in need of as we approach unto God, as we begin to put away sin, 
as we begin to have an experience and repentance, there's a certain type of comfort that is promised to us. So we want to keep that in mind as we go back to this story. As I said, this story should have an influence upon us. Uh, we should learn from this story. This story should uh, strengthen us. It should settle us in our faith. It should uh, strengthen our belief in God that despite not seeing things realized, we know that God's promise will be fulfilled. And it should comfort us as we put away sin, as we trust in God's willingness to forgive us and pardon us and ultimately blot out our sin. We don't have to go through depressed or down or cast down or, um, or in fear that our lives are in danger. Uh, because God has promised that we will be forgiven, we will be cleansed thoroughly. So um, very important to keep in mind as we approach into this story so that we can gather from the story exactly what God wants to give us. Uh, let's turn to the book of Joshua chapter 7. Uh, this is Sabbath school, so we uh, ask that you would participate. Um, I will take uh, maybe one or two comments uh, as we go through the questions. Uh, so that we can move through the questions. Make sure that uh, this is not to say you can't share or 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 um, give us what you have in your mind. We definitely want you to do that. But uh, put effort and seek to be very concise if you understand what I'm saying. Just so that we can have more people participate uh, who may want to participate, and we don't have to cut any comments off. Try to be concise with your thought and uh, try to find the simplest words uh, that will share it so that everyone could understand. We don't want a comment to create another question, if that makes sense. So please do uh, share, but try to be as concise as possible if you're able to do that. We're going to start in Joshua chapter seven, and I want to start in verse 13. Joshua chapter seven and verse 13, and our goal with the little bit of time that we have, we only have about 30 minutes or so. Um, we're gonna try to read through this and answer the rest of these questions so we can have a new Sabbath school teacher next Sabbath. Verse 13, um, if you remember, this is uh, God responding to Joshua's prayer. Uh, Joshua was concerned about the people because men died in a war that they shouldn't have died in. They should have conquered AI. They did not conquer AI, so it led to self-examination. The Bible says in verse 13 of Joshua 7, this is God speaking to his people. He says, up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. Very, very important. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe was taken, I'm sorry, and the tribe of Judah was taken, and he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zer Zarhites, and he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi was taken, and he brought his household man by man, and Achan the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken, and Joshua said, Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done, hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. 
And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garments and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with the stones and burnt them and burned them with the fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Very serious story. So much here that we want to gather from it. So many important points. Uh, we're going to seek to run through these questions as quick as possible um, and then uh, try to zero in with some specific detail with your comments and questions. Uh, question 11 from our lesson says, before they could stand before their enemies, what must be done? Before they could stand before their enemies, what must be done? This is a question we want to apply to ourselves also. Before we can stand before our enemies, what must be done? Verse 13 again, it says, up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. It's very important to note that the Bible teaches, God makes it very clear that when there is an accursed thing among us, we cannot stand before our enemies or we will be fallen before our enemies, which practically, practically means we will be defeated, we will be overcome, okay? Um, we may want to consider what are the enemies that we have today. Uh, one of the main, or the, the enemy that's probably on the top of the list is self. I hope everyone caught that self. Uh, self is on the top of that list. And then beyond that, we have the fact that we are in a spiritual warfare. The enemy would then also be referred to, or in using the word enemy, we are also referring to Satan and the fallen angels. And then for those who, uh, for I should say for those of us who may not uh, be willing to settle differences in this regular life, then you may have human enemies, uh, people that you have conflict with and so on and so forth, which we should not. Uh, that third option should really not be there because uh, God has given us clear instruction on how to deal with conflicts and issues with others. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to necessarily focus on the third option. Um, let if someone will be an enemy let them be an enemy because they hate you and let them hate you for following god but not for something you may have done uh your attitude your words your inconsideration or whatever the case may be let's not let's not have enemies because of something we have done if someone chooses to be our enemy let it be because we are following god and they just disagree with it uh, but for the most part, the first two on that list, self and the devil and the fallen angels or Lucifer and the fallen angels, those two, I would say, would be the enemies that should be on the top of the list and that we should consider as we go through our Christian experience. Based upon this verse, the Bible says, if there is something that is accursed before us or simply something that is cursed or something that should be hated. When something is cursed, um, I have a bottle of water here. If this bottle of water was cursed, it would be something that should be hated. So a bottle of water is not cursed because water is pure, water is good. But if it was stagnant water, water that had waste in it, it would be something that is a curse, something that should be hated, if that makes sense. Okay. So the Bible here says that whenever something that should be hated is among us, we will fall before our enemies. We will fall before self, meaning we will not have self-control. Self will be the leader 
Self will rule the life. And included with that, the devil, meaning uh, when we refer to the devil as the enemy, the devil works through temptations and often you can say trials, as it were, or hardships, bringing difficult experiences upon humans. We have Job as a example of that. So just to be clear, brothers and sisters, the Bible says if there's something that we harbor, that we keep, that should be hated, okay? This cannot apply to the Bible or something that is pure, something that should be loved, something that is clean. It cannot be applied to that. It has to only apply, or it only applies to something that should be hated. The Bible says as long as something like that is among us, whether it is a tangible reality, whether it is uh, maybe if this water was stolen, then it would be something that is a curse, something that should be hated, but sh something that should be hated. But also, brothers and sisters, something can be intangible internally, meaning a thought or an opinion or a feeling. Also, those things can be accursed. So as long as we have something like that, the Bible is illustrating that we will fall before self. Self will rule us and temptations will come and conquer us or even hardship, trials, difficulties that are brought about from Satan will also bring us down or cause us to be in a fallen state. Let me add a verse to this before I take any comments. Go back to Joshua chapter six. And again, we're just answering question 11. Um, question 11 was before they could stand before their enemies, what must be done? Well, what must be done is the accursed thing or the thing that is hateful or that should be hated must be put away. So it's very important to settle that in our minds that unless I put away the things that should be hated, I will never be able to stand. I will not be able to have victory over sin, over self, over Satan, over his temptations, over circumstances. Many of us are controlled by circumstances. As things happen, our Christian experience, our uh, disposition, it, it varies or it changes or fluctuates based upon the experience. God's people are to be like Christ, never failing, never being discouraged, always constant, always hopeful, because we have things to hope for. We have promises from God. I want to read Joshua chapter 6, as I said, and then I'm going to take any comments or questions. Joshua chapter 6, let's go to uh, verse 26. Joshua chapter 6, not verse 26. Let's go to verse 17. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 17. This is somewhat review, something we considered in the past, but it uh, gives a bit more understanding on the accursed things or the things that are cursed. That's all that's saying. Something that is accursed is just something that is cursed, something that we should hate something that is hateful, something that is detestable, something that we, look, we should look at with disdain, something that we should look at and be turned off from it. So the Bible says in verse 17 of Joshua chapter 6, it says, and the city shall be accursed even it. Remember Jer You remember Jericho? God says that entire city was accursed, meaning as you would look upon that city, it should not be something that you should look at and take pleasure in. Um, one extreme example, but this fits for many cities, almost all cities, to be honest, is the city of Las Vegas, where they have certain phrases associated with Las Vegas that just means uh, you can be here and live any type of way you want without being condemned and no one will say anything, okay? Las Vegas is one of those places, or you can say... Uh, I think even people would probably say, and this is not to down anyone from the, well, I won't even go there. I'll just mention Las Vegas, and this is not to down anyone who lives in Las Vegas. When we mention Las Vegas, we're specifically talking about the place where all the gambling and prostitution and all those things uh, take place. Uh, that is, those things are hateful things. Those are things that ruin lives and, and destroy people, things that when we look at it, we say, that's not good for people. So I'm just giving that as an example. Jericho was like that. But as I said, this generally applies to cities generally because cities are places, are hotbeds for evil. It's where many people congregate to do and live in all type of ways that are displeasing to God.
okay? And I'm not specifically dealing with you being in the city. You may be a believer and a Christian, which I believe that is the case, but how God generally views cities or places where a lot of sin takes place, these things are a curse. Joshua was like that. The Bible says in verse 17, and all that are therein to the Lord, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house because she hid the messengers that we sent. So God shows that even though cities can be corrupt, even though cities are a curse, those who are there that help the Lord or come up to the help of the Lord or do God's will are people that are not to be joined to that city or considered as a part of that city. It's the same for us. Uh, it's the same for Lot. If we're living up to the life that we know, then brothers and sisters, in many ways, we don't have anything to worry about. We just have to be faithful. God does not bind you to that city and the destruction of that city. Very important to know. But verse 18 is the key verse. It says, and ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Notice, lest ye make yourselves accursed. Did you catch that, brothers and sisters? Wait a minute. If I take this water this if this is the impure water i'm just using this today this wasn't planned <laughs> but this is something that i'm drinking but if this was terrible uh disease water sick water uh wastewater and i took part of it the bible says that i become what this water was meaning if i take something that is hateful or should be hated if i take it if i participate in it if i do it if I make it a part of my lifestyle or a part of my reality, then the Bible says I become cursed just like that item was cursed. So this is important for us as believers to consider, is there anything that we are taking part in or that we are accustomed to or that we share in that is accursed? Because the Bible teaches that if you partake of that thing, then the, that, that thing that, that is cursed makes you also cursed makes you to be hated, makes you to be detestable. So all the same uh, characteristics of that item in its cursed state becomes us, brothers and sisters. We become hated. We become uh, sick or whatever you want to, whatever terrible word you use to describe it, that becomes us if I partake of that thing. It says, lest ye make yourselves a curse when ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it so it also affects the people of God and it's true think about something that is bad that is contaminated uh, after you touch it you may touch others and the contamination actually spreads so the Bible says this is the reality with things that are evil just like we have that reality in just practical life if you touch something that is contaminated you can easily spread it to others which means it's better to never touch it. The same thing happens in the spiritual sense. When we touch something that is hateful or accursed, the Bible says when we bring it to ourselves, those that we are connected to, those that we are tied to, they also can be contaminated or affected by that reality. Um, are there any comments or questions before we move on? Please feel free. Pastor, I, I have a comment. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, man, I was just trying to take in what I was trying to understand because I got distracted and I feel like it's the enemy and I told my child that, but the thing is, what you were just covering, I'm trying to make sure that I recognize it. Is is this in fact the uh, accursed thing? Because my daughter texts me and normally I turn my phone off on Sabbath. And so that way I'm not available and it's not like, and my children are the one thing that can really get my attention. And then, but the internet went out in my place uh, yesterday and I can't get it fixed until Sunday. They wanted to come today and I said, no, I, I would only be available Sunday. Anyway, she texted and I wasn't going to respond. And then she called and then I'm like, oh my goodness. So I answer. And I'm letting her know I'm in Zoom church and I'm trying not to miss it. And what's going on? And she's like, my cat just needs blood. And animals are also a very sensitive point for me. And so it's just like, oh no. 
And I'm thinking, let me rush this because I don't want to miss the word. And then she sends me the picture and there's blood. And I'm like, okay, that is Frank blood. That's not old blood. And so we get into this brief discussion. I, I finally just tell her, you need to pray about this. I said, you need to ask the Lord to lead you on what to do because she's trying to decide if I should take him to the vet or should I do this or that. And I said, pray about it and the Lord will lead you. And she's just like, well, I don't know if I want to. And it's like, why am I even wasting time here? And so then I'm thinking when I get back and I hear what you said, and it's just like I'm catching the tail end of it. And, and I'm, I'm also recognizing that a neighbor that I'm trying to witness to keeps wanting to give me gifts. And the Lord was trying to show me, and I knew it was the Lord, that these gifts are from a spiritual, like spirituality thing. And I asked her, I said, where is this from? And she's just like, oh, it's been with me in all these places. And it almost seems like you, you know what you're doing because you know where I stand, you know my beliefs, and I've tried to share them with you. And, and yet you, you insist on doing what you want to do. So it's like, I prayed about it. I'm like, Lord, help me to, to say this or deal with this correctly. And, and, and then I was reminded of your sermon last Sabbath. And it's just like the, the idol that Aiken had, and it caused the whole camp to suffer. And this thing she gave me, it looks like some type of spiritual significant thing. It's two dolphins that are facing each other and they have a circle that they make. And I asked her, cause I just felt like, is this, cause she's half Hawaiian and she kind of goes into all this spiritualism. And I'm like, yeah, that's not in the Bible. And so we talk and I even tried to admonish her about her daughter putting her in karate. And I'm like, you know, that's actually got some Eastern mysticism, spirituality to it. And you really don't want to do that. And I'm like, she's, she's a very sensitive little girl. She's only five. And I did it too. I put my kids in karate. So I was sharing with her. I didn't know, but I know now I know better that that thing opens up the door to something else. And it, it's teaching them something else. Anyway, she doesn't want to listen. So I'm like, Lord, do I give this, this little monument thing back to her? Will that offend her? Is this, is this going to dampen my relationship with her? But at the same time, I don't want to be like trying to maintain something that's corrupt because if she's not willing, like you were saying about the person who in, in the light of their understanding are trying their best, she's rejecting the truth. She said, I don't, I don't want to hear about the Sabbath. I don't believe in the Sabbath. So she's just kind of like rejecting it. So then do I, I don't know. I just wanted to make sure that what am I really dealing with here? My children, my neighbor, is this something that you would say would fall under this hated thing that I should um, have my guard up against? Very, very good question. I appreciate it. Um, so there's a number of things that was mentioned. Um, and I, 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 I really like uh, question. So I'll try to summarize because uh, I think there was a number of things that was mentioned um, in, sorry. Uh, okay. Do um, you want to give your comment and then we'll address and then go back to the lessons? This will be the, the last comment before we go to the next question. I'm sorry. And then we'll take more comments. So if you have a comment, we will get to it, but it will be after the next question if you don't mind. Please share your comment. Yes, I just wanted to share, um, as you were talking about uh, the accursed thing, uh, it, it has a lot of simil similarities to um, when God calls his people out of Babylon. And um, I was also thinking about when uh, he draws the line between uh, righteousness and unrighteousness and light with darkness. And it's, it's just showing that God is trying to receive us and draw a line between evil and good. And even with the, the second angel dealing with um, Babylon, he says, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. And we see um, Achan being a partaker of a Babylonish garment or taking something that is of a Babylonish nature and then him being destroyed with the accursed thing or being a partaker of her uh, sins. Amen. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, very good correlation. Um, 
that brings to view that what we partake in represents us for the most part. Um, we'll address both of those before we take this next question, just in regards to my dear sister. Um, those type of experiences with other souls, we have to be very cautious, very wise, and we have to always be prayerful and we have to be clear on what our agenda is. Uh, people often talk about secret agendas and the reality is Christians, we all have secret agendas. And our secret agenda is to bring Christ before another soul. So anytime I'm presenting with those type of difficult experiences, those challenging experiences, experiences where I am aware that the individual I'm dealing with is, um, uh, you know, either confrontational or uh, not receptive, or they may have some, uh, I guess, some, uh, I don't know what the word would be but they're kind of reluctant to receive what, I, what I'm sharing. I always try to show interest in their views, meaning uh, I don't want to know what they believe, but I want to know how they came to the conclusion and why. I don't necessarily want to know what is the belief per se, because I, I won't believe in it. I believe in the Bible, but I would like to understand how they think, what brought them to that point. And with that item that she sought to give you, I would encourage you to inquire what does it mean and why she gave that and in that experience you have freedom also to share uh how and why you receive gifts and what they represent if that makes sense and she may see that oh, okay you know what this is probably not even a gift that i should give you or it's maybe something i should even take back because i understand now better your view and how you view things how you must be cautious and also now you understand her view and how she does things and why she's doing these things. So we don't have to be, uh, uh, I guess, uh, overly cautious, although we have to be cautious. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people may say, well, you know, there's a spirit that goes with that thing. Well, uh, you have to remember how do spirits influence and affect humans? Uh, we don't necessarily believe in voodoo, as it were. Not to say those things uh, are not true. For those who are involved, there's a lot of supernatural evil things taking place. But for those who are following God, the verse that we read makes it very clear that if we take the accursed thing, meaning we are doing something wrong, okay? This is not something that you have taken from the lady. This is not something you're involved in. This is not something you have or care or have regard for. So as far as you're concerned, that your view of that item is the same view that Paul had. Paul says, what is an idol? He says, this is it's a vain thing. Uh, whatever it is, you know, they may give it to you as a little relic or whatever, but it may just be a polished stone. That's what most of them, those little relics and things are. It's, number one, it's a stone, which means that's God's stone. You just made a design on it because you're a pagan. You know, it doesn't necessarily bring a curse on my life. What brings the curse is when we are doing something that God is displeased with, when God has commanded us, do not participate in this. Now, if you were taking that relic and now worshiping it or paying homage to him, to it, then you definitely have a problem. But as far as, you know, someone just giving you something, it is what it is. It's just a stone. It's just two dolphins. It's just, now, if it was a little demonic evil face, then I may personally be re reluctant just because of what is publicly representing. And I would say, why would you give me this? You know, I would want to inquire even more. But beyond that, it may be that she considers you to be a friend or someone that she has a regard for, and she's just trying to do something nice. So I would take it as an opportunity to share the gospel, to introduce Christ, and to um, do it from the perspective of the relic. You don't have to necessarily go with something that she's already showing that she rejects, but you can say, you know what? There are some things that I also hold dear. You gave me this. There's some little things that I hold dear also. And then you can say, I can share that with you. Just like I've received something from you, I want to share something with you that's special to me also. So I would try to take a um, the ministry route, which I believe you've probably already done and you've been praying about, uh, but you don't necessarily have to be afraid of someone giving you something unless you have your own personal, you know, things that you don't want to be involved with. But generally, uh, a little relic or something that somebody has from their religion 
it, it cannot bring a curse upon us, brothers and sisters, unless we are in harmony with those teachings and beliefs and we submit ourselves over to those things. But at the bottom line, we always pray about it. Lord, what should I do with this thing? How should I handle it? That's our basis before we do anything. But generally, we don't have to be afraid of anything in the world. Everything in this world, for the most part, belongs to God, and they cannot put any special power or evil on it. That's just not how demons work, per se. On TV, they work that way. But in real life, demons work through temptations. They work through uh, bringing hardships, so on and so forth. The Bible gives many examples on how demons interact to trouble and harm humans. And it usually, almost always, has to be something that we submit ourselves to or we allow ourselves to be under that influence. But beyond that, they cannot really do anything to us. Um, in regards to what Terrence was sharing, you can look at Psalms 115. I'm not going to go there, but Psalms 115, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, brings to view that thing that he talked about, that Babylonian garment and the influence upon the life. Uh, first, uh, pardon me, Psalms 115 is a place where God talks about that those who make the idols are like the idols. So uh, really, when we see uh, Achan taking that accursed thing, it's just really revealing his character. And we know that. Isn't that what sin does? Ultimately, we may present ourselves to be Christians, but if we're living in sin and we're participating in sin, then what's happening is that is a revelation of our character. If it's secret sins, people may not know about it. But nevertheless, it is still a reflection of your character. It is still showing what is in the heart. And if it is sin there, then it is identifying that Christ is not in the heart and we are not considered children of God at that moment. If we turn to God, God will readily accept us, but we must turn to God and remain in harmony with God to remain as his children. So as I said, I wanna move on to the next question. I, would, I was trying to get through this lesson which is fine if we, uh, the next Sabbath school teacher may just have to continue. Um, but I will take comments after we deal with this next question. Uh, the Bible says in uh, verse 14 and 15, let's read that really quickly. I'm gonna read 14, 15. <sighs> let's, yeah, let's just go ahead and read verses 14 and 15. And we'll answer this question. We'll try to get through the, at least two or three more questions. Uh, the question says, what course was to be pursued to detect the sin? So this lets us know that as far as Israel was concerned, this was somewhat of a secret sin. Everyone did not know about this sin that Achan participated in. And what did Achan do? He took of the accursed thing as well as he took some precious metals, right? Now, if you remember the accursed things, were to be destroyed with the city. And then all the valuables, the precious metals, they belong to the treasury of the Lord, if you remember that. Um, I, I didn't, I don't think I read it to you all, but verses 18 and 19 of chapter six is where you can refer to that, okay? Verse 18 deals with not, part, not taking something that was a curse or something that God says should be hateful, which was that, Babylonish garment. And then verse 19 deals with the various precious metals that belong to the treasury of the Lord. So this means that things that uh, was uh, probably used in the lifestyle of the Babylonians or that represented the lifestyle of the Babylonians, that was taken. Very good example to apply to us today. What things have you taken from the big city or the world generally that is displeasing to God? Have you taken the dress of the world? Have you taken the diet of the world? Have you taken the false education of the world? What are the things that you have adopted, which God says, hey, don't adopt that. Those things are very dangerous because they will have an influence upon you. And don't think that you can take those things and not be affected. That is a deception that many of us have. We think that we can eat however we want, dress however we want, have whatever lifestyle we want and not be affected. The Bible says you will be cursed. You are cursed as a result. And then if we deal with the precious metals, that can be tied to how we deal with our finances. Uh, brothers and sisters, that's a whole study in itself. How are we faithful in paying tithes? Are we faithful in giving offering? Is our finances open up to the supporting of the work, the supporting of the poor? We may have to reevaluate these things. I learned, brothers and sisters, I had this one early on in my experience. I'll mention it and then we'll read the verse. 
I used to spend tithe money like it was my money. Meaning uh, I didn't spend it on myself, but I distributed it how I wanted to. And I said, you know, I, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't aware that the tithe belonged to the Lord and that there were restrictions and there were certain things. Certain people will say, I, you know what? I don't like this minister, so I don't want to give them tithe. But they listen to the minister. They consider the minister or they may even be tied to a local body and they just don't know how the tithe should go there. There are people who actually go to church, a specific church, are fed by the minister, but they don't pay tithes there to the church to the minister, pretty much. That's what it's going to ultimately, but they don't pay tithes there because of their issue with another person. Can you imagine that? I don't like these couple of people and because I don't like them, I won't support the church or the minister with the tithe and I won't support them with offerings. So they send their tithe and offering somewhere else while they're being fed. That's not the gospel order if you think about it. Go back to look at Abraham's life, one of the first men who paid tithe. He gave it to somebody who brought forth the bread and the wine, the word and doctrine to him. He says, this is where my tithe will go. As I said, these are, this is another story, another topic, but stewardship is something that has to be studied deeply because we will be held accountable for, for, for how we handle the monies of the Lord, not just tithe, but also offering. That's just a side note. Let's read verses 14 and 15. I only mention those things because chapter six mentions the accursed thing as, the, as well as the things that belong to the treasury of the Lord, which brings to view general sin and idolatry as, also, as well as our faithfulness with the things that God has brought into our possession, which was the experience with Israel when they conquered Jericho. Verse 14 says, in the morning, therefore ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it should be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man, and it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. Uh, some major points here. Uh, question 12 was, what course was to be pursued to detect the sin? What was the method that God used to find out where the sin was? Now, brothers and sisters, I will tell you, this is a very important portion of scripture because in the scripture, we see one of the few examples of the judgment of the living. Did you catch that? You want to know what the judgment of the living is like? Here is a very good picture of the judgment of the living. The Bible says God was seeking out the sin. Where is the sin? And it showed that there was an order. And it went from, you know, larger groups to more specific groups. We can say for us, uh, it would probably start with our nation, as it were, and the leadership of our nation be broken down to states, be broken down to cities, be broken down to villages, if it goes that far. It may just go from state, our nation, to the people. I'm not sure the order that by, in which God will, you know, and in which it trickles down, but I know that it is specific and it will eventually get to family, and then man by man. This is an amazing picture of the judgment of the living. Actually, let me add another verse to this, and then we'll take our comments. The Bible shows how the sin was to be detected. Go to Ecclesiastes 7. The Bible shows how the judgment was to take place in order for God to find out the sin. I would say it's probably likely in our time that God will not even have to be so specific because so many practice the sins of their parents and their grandparents, so on and so forth. Uh, the unfortunate curse of the Bible is upon many generations. You know what the Bible says in the commandments, that when we break the law of God, uh, when we don't keep the law of God, you know, as a result of not keeping the law of God, you know, generation after generation can be cursed as a result of that. And it just represents that if I'm not a law keeper, my children won't be law keepers and their children will not be law keepers. If I keep the law, then it's very likely my children will keep the law and they will continue to per perpetuate obedience throughout, brothers and sisters. A perfect example of this, of this is found in the fact that today we are Christians. Why are we Christians? Well, because our forefathers who took hold of the gospel 
pass down the gospel to many generations. That's why you're a Christian. That's why I'm a Christian because of faithful parents of the past who had possession of the gospel. And when I'm saying parents, specifically I'm referring to spiritual parents. Paul is the one who mentions, I believe in Corinthians, he says, you know, I have birthed many as it were. I am a children of many. I think it's second Corinthians. Uh, I don't, I can't remember. I want to say 13, but I can't remember. But he, put, he, he paints a picture that he is a father over young women, over churches. So there is a spiritual reality that is taking place that is allowed for you and I to be Christians today because of faithful parents in the word of God, as it were. Spiritual parents, okay? Spiritual grandparents, spiritual ancestors is probably a better way to say it. That applies to us. I want to read this verse here in Ecclesiastes, then I'll take some more comments. We'll probably take one more question and then we'll have to close. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 27, this is just another picture that confirms this reality of the judgment. Now, brothers and sisters, many teach that the judgment happens at the coming of Christ. The great white throne judgment happens all the way at the end. I want to tell you, we've studied this, but I want to just remind you that the, the great white throne judgment happens now before the coming of Christ. The judgment day or the judgment that takes place at the coming of Christ is called the executive judgment, okay? That judgment day that people often refer to is the executive judgment where the sentences are executed or where there's an execution of the judgment that is written, okay? That happens at the coming of Christ and then there's a thousand years and then it happens even, I don't wanna say even more, but then it is settled after the thousand years where people receive their final sentence. Um, we may have to go over that to understand better in the future. Nevertheless, I want to read Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 27. The Bible says, Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. There are many other verses here. You can read Ecclesiastes 12, I think, verse 14, uh, Romans 14 and verse 21. These are all verses that bring to view that all will give an account of himself to God. So the story of Achan is a picture of every human in the judgment. I hope you caught that. The rest of those people during the time of Joshua at that moment did not face the judgment, but it is only because it wasn't their time. But that picture of Achan is a picture for every human. Every human's life will be looked at and God will see what has the, is there any accursed thing in your dwelling? Is there anything that is evil that you have held on to, as whether it's secret or public, but is there anything evil that you have been unwilling to give up and you must be punished for? The final judgment, the final punishment is what will happen to anyone who harbors sin, who keeps sin. And as I said, that is the picture that we are getting from Achan. That picture applies to every single human. So as we consider verses 14 and 15, it just brings to view that the judgment is very specific and it comes down to every single individual whose, lives, whose life will be looked at by God to determine is their sin still there or have they accepted Christ, which allows for their sin to be paid for on the cross, meaning you died on the cross, as it were, or the life that you were supposed to give was giving at the cross of Christ because Christ was our substitute. He gave his life for us. Therefore, we don't have to die. If we don't give up the sin, then our judgment day is coming where we will experience the same thing that Achan experienced. Any comments or questions, feel free. Make sure they're concise, brothers and sisters, so we can take as many as possible. Please take the opportunity now. Then we will move on to question 13 to close. No, no comments. Let's close with question 13. As a result, who was taken? As a result of God finding the sin in Achan, who was taken? Well, we've already identified that. Let's go back to Joshua chapter seven and verse 16 through 18. This is where we will be closing. Um, I would love to dwell on this topic of the judgment of the living, um, and we may do that uh, on another occasion. 
But nevertheless, it is very serious, brothers and sisters. Uh, we will all have to stand before God. I've been in court. I used to work in law, and it is a very serious thing. Um, you do not play with the law, and there are set things that you just can't get around. If someone is guilty, they are guilty. Um, there's nothing you can say to get out of that, and there is a judgment. If you have done a crime, and you have been found guilty of that crime, there is no, well, what can I do? The only thing you can do is receive your sentence. That is the case for the judgment of the living. That is the case for all judgment, even of the dead. For instance, if I die before, um, before the, the end of time or before the coming of Christ, then I enter into the judgment of the dead. And there is a time where in the judgment, the dead and the living are being judged concurrently or at the same time, brothers and sisters. Um, nevertheless, Joshua 7, let's go ahead and read this and close. Joshua 7. Uh, I'll read, I'll start in verse 16. What we didn't mention, which I will encourage you to consider, as well as the next teacher. I believe there'll be another teacher next Sabbath. If not, then I will continue, but I believe there will be. Um, was verse 15. The Bible says that the reason why all this happened was because Josh, not Joshua, but Achan, or the guilty party, broke the covenant. Now, I want you to think about that. How did they break the covenant? God just said, don't take of the accursed thing and don't take the precious metals that were belonging to the treasury of God. So those two things are considered transgressing the covenant. So you have to say, well, wait a minute, Lord, what is the covenant? The covenant for just to summarize it as brief and short as possible, just represents the agreement between God and his people that they will obey God and that God will be their their creator and their redeemer. I hope that makes sense, okay? That's a simple way to say it. It's an agreement between God and his people that they will be his people, meaning they will be his obedient servants and God will be their loving father and protector and redeemer and also and provider, so on and so forth, okay? That's the covenant. So what Achan did broke that. What do you mean? So Achan's behavior, Achan's decision represented that God was no longer his father, no longer his provider, no longer his redeemer. He's rejected him as a creator. If that is the case, what was Achan saying? Achan was saying, I am God. I hope you caught this now. Achan was saying, God is being replaced. God is being removed. Whenever we transgress the covenant, we're saying, I have a new God. And the God that is to be my God, my Father, the true God, the living God, the creator God, we're saying he is no longer our God. We are no longer his servants. We have a new God. We have a new whatever to worship or to serve. So for Achan, that was his accursed thing. That was his money. The Bible talks about the God of Mammon. But also the Bible says he took a Babylonish garment. Now, what you will learn about Babylon, not only Babylon, but for every nation and for every people, what you do, as I said before, Psalms 115, what you do represents who you worship and who you serve. So having the garments of a Babylonian means that you serve a Babylonian God. You worship a Babylonian God. Just like today, people may dress a certain way. Uh, you will see that, especially in the homosexual community, they dress in a very scantily way or they dress according to the opposite sex. Those are gods, or pardon me, the opposite gender. They're, they're worshiping and they're showing their commitment to a specific God or a specific belief system that they live by. It's tied to their lifestyle. It's the same thing today. How do you carry yourself? You may dress and carry yourself in your lifestyle in a way that represents the world or idolatry versus representing God. The way you eat, the way you dress, the way you think, your education, how you feel, all of those things, brothers and sisters, as I said, they represent how you worship and who you worship. So if we participate in the wrong things, we break the covenant. We've chosen another God. We've identified we're not God's servants. And brothers and sisters, we are left in a bad position. We want to avoid this reality. This is what Joshua 7 is bringing to view. It's a lot of things to consider, but brothers and sisters, we need to consider these things and we need to have them in our minds so we're aware that, listen, everything I'm doing, it means something. 
there is no small thing in my life that doesn't mean anything. Everything means something, and there's a reason why I'm doing it, and there's worship tied to it. There's nothing we do in life that's not tied to worship. I hope you know that. Don't forget, Paul makes it clear. He says, ye are the temples of the Holy Ghost. We are temples, brothers and sisters, walking temples, which means everything we do is tied to worship. Let's finish reading this verse so we can close. Verse 16 says, so Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes and the tribe of Judah was taken and he brought the family of Judah and he took the family of the Zarhites and he brought the family of Zarhites man by man and Zabdi was taken and he brought his household man by man and Achan the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken and Joshua said unto Achan, my son, listen closely, brothers and sisters, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel. Wait a minute. God wanted him to give glory. Now, this man had just committed open sin. We're in the judgment hour. This is a judgment of the living. The request of God's servant to Achan was give glory to him. Now, this was at the, this was at the judgment. Now, we don't have time to go into this, but Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, you want to read it in your own time. The first angel's message talks about first the gospel and the messengers of the gospel going into every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Then it talks about the beginning of the judgment hour. Beginning of the judgment hour begins, and then it says we are to fear God and to give glory to God. One thing that is very important is Every man will give glory to God. The, the, the question is whether you will give glory to God before the judgment closes or after the judgment closes. Giving glory to God before the judgment closes allows you to actually pass through the judgment and come out as more than a conqueror, to come out as somebody who can actually glorify God and who will share in the throne of God's glory. You will actually be a partaker of that throne, you will rule with God in his glory on that throne, or you will give God's, God the glory in the closing judgment, and you will die. And guess what? The death of the wicked also will give glory to God even. It will glorify God, or it will exalt God's throne as the, I don't want to say God, exalt God's throne, but it will exalt God as the true and living God. You see, brothers and sisters, we don't have time to go into it, but everything that God does is good. And those who will be destroyed in the end will acknowledge that them being destroyed is acceptable and right of God to do. Every man will give an honest judgment, brothers and sisters, in the end of who God is and his character. Every man will give glory to God. Question 13 says, as a result, who was taken? We know that Achan was taken, brothers and sisters, but this is only bringing to view that any one of us, as I said, that holds on to sin before it is too late, we will also be taken. And the likelihood of others being destroyed as a result, guess what? It's highly likely. You see, right now, we can either be lights in the world where others are influenced and encouraged by the gospel truth, and they can also turn to God, or we can be lights under a bushel. We can be darkness. And that same influence will be used to take people away from God, but to worship and to be faithful to Satan, to be destroyed in the end. It's very important for us to be wise at this time and to use our influence to glorify God. We will not be able to take any closing comments. I'm sorry. We're going to close with a word of prayer. Please forgive me for those who may have been on the edge of their seat. I pray that you will keep the comment, and the next time we come together, you will have the opportunity. I know it may seem like it's going to fade away, but brothers and sisters, the word of God and the confirmation of God's word is very powerful. So please hold on to it. It is important. We do want to hear, and we want to take the jewel that you have found and be able to glorify in it and behold it also. So please don't forget what the point you wanted to make. Write it down so that the next time we come together, we can do all of that for time's sake. We're going to close here with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus and we pause and humble ourselves before your presence. 
you are truly a holy God. And we have been able to see the judgment of the living, what it is like, and that you will look at our lives individually. Although oftentimes among humans, we find ourselves focusing on other people's sins and other people's hypocrisy and other people's disobedience and other people's neglect. But in the judgment, there will be no one else for us to look to. Only our own lives will be looked at and criticized by thee. Lord, unless Christ covers us, we will not make it through the judgment. You will find sin. Our sin is not hidden to you. It may be hidden to one another, but Lord, as you look upon our lives, you will find the sin. You will find the church. I know you will find the church opinion, feeling, thought, belief, whatever it is, practice even. And Lord, if there is sin, we will be condemned. Therefore, you have devised a glorious plan, even the plan of salvation, to help us to cast away all idols, all sins, all false ideas, all terrible thoughts and feelings. Anything that is unlike you now is the time because, Lord, when there is a great defeat, when it is made clear that there is a line drawn between those who serve you and serve you not, just like in the time of Joshua, it was made clear that they were not serving you at the time of defeat. Lord, when this day returns, when many are cast down, when many are fallen, and many are exposed, then, Lord, it will be too late. I pray that you would help us to do the opposite of what Achan did. He was supposed to give glory to you before they went out to war so that those men could have been spared. He waited until it was too late and he had to lose his life just like those men lost their lives. Help us to take advantage of the present time before the decree goes forth to find ourselves in harmony with you, to get rid of the accursed thing now before it is forever too late. We thank you that through the sacrifice of our savior, Jesus Christ, we can get rid of the accursed thing and even be found guilty of the accursed thing, but to be pardoned because Christ died for our sin and guilt. We thank you, Father, for making a way to save us. We thank you for those who participated and for those who desired to repeat and confirm your word. May their uh, intensity of desire be as a fire that they would share these things with us, that we may be whole and glorify your name in this present time. Please forgive us of our sins as we acknowledge your promise that if we confess and forsake, if we confess our accursed thing and give it up now, then your promise is that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to testify of your goodness towards us even now and your mercy and forgiveness of our sins. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Amen.